today in a dramatic turnaround, ExxonMobil reporting its highest profit in a year. But even with oil prices high, it's not spending more on production. Scarlett Johansson sues Disney over the Black Widow streaming release. What's the problem and what does Disney have to say? That and much more, coming up on NTD Business. Good evening, great to have you with us. I'm Paul Graney. Consumer goods giant Procter & Gamble beat quarterly sales estimates today, but it warns rising raw material and freight costs would take a big bite out of its earnings this year, as much as $2 billion. Higher prices for supplies like pulp and resin and a transportation bill that could be $100 million higher due to driver shortage are putting pressure on its bottom line. But the company is banking on price hikes and cutting costs to ease the pain. As net sales were up 7% last quarter, a lot of it came from higher demand for health, skin and oral care products. Its high-end SK2 brand did particularly well as consumers dressed up to return to social events. And ExxonMobil beat estimates too and posted its largest profit in a year. Oil output fell, but higher prices and demand for plastics made up for it. And the Con Fredrickson has more. ExxonMobil posted its biggest quarterly profit in more than a year. Higher oil prices and record earnings at its chemicals business boosted its bottom line. We're very pleased with the company's performance of the first six months of this year from a number of perspectives, including safety, reliability, earnings, cash flow, and debt reduction. Second quarter saw a rapidly recovering environment with significant improvement in all our product markets. Exxon shows how oil producers are taking advantage of recovering oil prices to cut debt and boost shareholder payouts instead of spending more to raise production. Exxon was able to cut debt by almost $3 billion. While Exxon's oil output fell, higher oil prices pushed earnings higher, and earnings from its chemicals and plastics business rose nearly five-fold from a year ago. The company could expand margins with strong demand for plastic packaging, tight industry supply, and shipping constraints. But Exxon's refining business hasn't recovered. It lost money for six quarters in a row. Outside the United States, refining operations have run in the red in five of the last six quarters. And earlier this year, a board fight over the company's direction shook up the company. An activist investor cast out three directors. They were replaced by nominees who promised to boost returns and better prepare the company for a low-carbon world. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. Now we learned today that Amazon was recently hit with a big fine from the European Union. As much as $900 million, 4% of Amazon's revenue in 2020. It's the biggest ever fine from the EU over data privacy. The EU says Amazon processed personal data in violation of the bloc's data privacy law known as GDPR. It's not clear exactly what Amazon did wrong, the law requires companies to seek people's consent before using their personal data. The penalties for breaching it can be steep, as we see. Amazon says, though, it believes the decision to be without merit will file and will appeal the fine. Back in the U.S., Amazon stocks fell 8% today, missed its quarterly revenue target for the first time in three years, reported a slowing in sales growth, and that really hit its share price. This web services business, though, Amazon Web Services, is still doing fine. Anthony's Patrick Hayden reports. Amazon's second quarter results released Thursday show a slowing in revenue, and it's expected to continue into the next quarter. New CEO Andy Jassy has picked up the reins of the company. CFO Brian Olsavsky fielded questions on the call. And uh, really the only difference I see is in uh, Q2 versus Q1 and before is, is the year of your comp, which we had factored in, but also um, the increase in mobility. I think the impact of people getting vaccinated and uh, getting out in the world, not, not only shopping uh, out, you know, uh, offline, but also you know, living life and you know, getting out. Customers started to do more shopping in brick and mortar stores as lockdowns eased. Revenue in Q2 rose by just 27%. That's down from the first quarter's 44% surge. Amazon had a record-breaking prime day, but Refinitiv data showed total revenue was below analysts' average estimates by $2 billion. Jassy's appointment comes as Amazon's business gets bigger and more complex. 
Last quarter, it announced a deal to buy the film studio MGM for $8.5 billion. It's also running its own grocery chain and building a healthcare business, all while facing increasing scrutiny from regulators worldwide. Amazon Web Services fared better. Its revenue grew 37% to $14.8 billion, beating estimates. Disruptive economic events like COVID have caused many people to step back and think about how they want to change strategically. And many have come to the conclusion that they do not want to own and run their own data centers. Labor shortages meant Amazon had to offer sign-on bonuses to attract some 75,000 workers. The quarter also included a failed unionization bid in Alabama. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And vaccine maker AstraZeneca says it lost money on its CCP virus vaccine during the first half of the year. The company had pledged to provide its vaccine at no profit during the course of the pandemic. Yesterday, it said losses from the vaccine shaved four cents off its earnings per share. A Wall Street Journal analysis shows AstraZeneca lost a total of $53 million in the vaccine during the first half of the year. But net profit for the same period is still 42 percent higher than last year. AstraZeneca also says it plans to seek U.S. approval for its CCP virus vaccine later this year. It's asking the Food and Drug Administration for full regulatory approval instead of the fast-track emergency youth authorization. And Marvel's superhero Black Widow has a new nemesis, the Disney Corporation. Actor Scarlett Johansson alleges the House of Mouse breached its contract by releasing Black Widow in theaters and on Disney Plus at the same time. And they just gone Fredrickson has the details. Black Widow is suing the Walt Disney Company. Scarlett Johansson, star of the Marvel movie Black Widow, alleges Disney breached her contract by releasing the film both in theaters and on Disney Plus at the same time. The contracts were based off of her making her money, most of her money, off the theatrical release. And that was where she was expecting the bulk of her income to come from. And when the film's released on two platforms, Johansson misses out on potential income. Many people watching on Disney Plus could have been watching in theaters. The suit says Marvel assured Johansson that it would be a theatrical release and that should the plan change, we would need to discuss this with you and come to an understanding as the deal is based on a series of very large box office bonuses. A Disney spokesman told the Wall Street Journal the suit had no merit and is especially sad and distressing in its callous disregard for the horrific and prolonged global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. From Disney's standpoint, that's probably their best argument is that we did a theatrical release. You didn't say anything about a simultaneous, you know, even though there was assurances that were sought that it was to be a theatrical release. The suit is consequential for the entertainment industry, especially as the pandemic changes the business environment. Studios never used to release films in two places at once like this. A lot of these big stars are being, um, in some ways, are in the middle of this. I think we're in the sort of transition moment, and what happens with the suit will go a long way to determining um, sort of who benefits out of this new sort of world uh, we're in. And uh, Meanwhile, Black Widow currently has a critic score of 81 percent and an audience score of 92 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's unclear if there will be a sequel, especially since Johansson's character did die in Avengers Endgame. Colin Fredrickson. NTD News. Stocks ended lower on Wall Street today, giving up their gains for the week. The Dow lost about 150 points, 0.4 percent. S&P 500 fell 24 points, half a percent today. But it did manage to end July higher, marking six monthly gains in a row. Nasdaq fell 106 points, 0.7 percent today. Walmart has updated its mask policy. Now retail workers in counties with virus hotspots will need to wear masks again, and all corporate staff will have to be vaccinated. This counters a Walmart rule that started in May that allowed fully vaccinated employees to work without masks. In-store signage will also encourage customers to wear masks. Walmart is also doubling the amount retail workers receive for getting vaccinated to $150. The move comes as health officials shifted health guidelines. Store managers are now advised to regularly check the CDC's website for changes to mass guidance in different locations. 
And as theaters in New York City reopen, Broadway audiences will now need masks and proof of vaccination. The Metropolitan Opera and Carnegie Hall also plan to restrict entry for children under 12 years old. The Broadway League says all of New York City's 41 Broadway theaters will require guests, performers and staff to be fully vaccinated for the CCP virus through October. Masks are also required for audience members, vaccinated or not. And the announcement comes day before Broadway's reopening after a 16-month shutdown. The league says it's, it's making exceptions, though, for people with medical conditions or religious beliefs that prevent vaccination. They would still need proof of a negative CCP virus test taken close to the, to the show date. And one major business advocacy group is afraid that the New York City recovery may get hurt if companies decide to follow the CDC's mask proposal. And the Phil Zoe has the story. Nonprofit organization Partnership for New York City says another mask mandate is going to stop people from returning to the office. The organization has over 300 members and business leaders who employ over 1 million New Yorkers, according to its website. Last month, the nonprofit estimated 60% of workers will return after Labor Day weekend, working at least three days a week in the office. But it says that's all going to change if New York City follows the CDC's recommendation to require masks indoors in public spaces. Having offices filled with workers is important to the city because commercial real estate taxes make up a large portion of tax revenue. If workers don't return, property value can go down, and so will the tax revenue. Major firms like Goldman Sachs, Chase Bank, and Morgan Stanley say they are watching and monitoring the mask situation. Companies like Apple and Uber have delayed workers' return to October. That's one month later than expected. Lyft is pushing back its return to office date to next year, February. Phil Zoe, NTD News. And a key inflation measure soared well beyond the Federal Reserve's 2% target to in the year to June, hitting levels not seen in 30 years. The Core Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, or Core PCE, rose 3.5% in the 12 months to June. Core PCE, which excludes volatile components of food and energy, is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge for calibrating policy and interest rates. But while some economists have raised the alarm on inflation, Fed officials insist price rises are just temporary. The Fed Chair Jerome Powell expects that in the next year or so, inflation will come back down to around the Fed's 2% target. Some economists worry, though, that if prices rise too fast, stay high for too long, it could trigger the kind of wage price spiral that plagued the U.S. economy in the 1970s. The Biden administration is putting strict new rules in place for Chinese companies planning to list in the United States. The Chinese businesses now need to make clear to investors that it's possible the Chinese Communist Party could interfere with its business operations at any moment, impacting financial results or contractual obligations. Also, Oftentimes, investing in a Chinese company isn't like investing in an American company where you literally own a share of the company. When you invest in many Chinese companies like Alibaba, for example, you're actually getting a share of a shell company that has a legal claim on Alibaba's profits and assets. The SEC believes most investors don't know this, and so from now on, the Chinese companies need to, be, need to make the investors fully aware of that from now on. There are other rules, too. The policy change comes after a high-profile IPO fail recently, ride-sharing app Didi. Investors poured $4.4 billion into the company, only to see Chinese regulators come come down hard on it afterwards. Didi's shares are down over 30% since IPO. And a new report details threats posed by China's Belt and Road Initiative. It looks at how Beijing has used debt trap diplomacy to get access to resources at the expense of other nations' sovereignty. Anthony's Patrick Hayden has the details. The Captive Nations Coalition has released a report showing how the Chinese Communist Party is trying to dominate the world. It's written from a U.S. national security and human rights perspective. We need to recognize internationally that the Communist Party of China is a transnational criminal organization. 
Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative is a multi-trillion dollar project billed as an investment plan. Logerson says 140 UN-recognized countries have signed on to it. Under the project, China pours funding into critical infrastructure around the world, including ports, highways and railroads. Critics say Beijing uses it to gain influence over countries, leaving relatively poorer nations in debt and taking control of newly funded infrastructure, and above all, using it as an influence circle to counter the West. Looking at the Belt and Road debt-to-GDP ratio shows China basically owns others already. And what we find is that the debt-to-GDP ratio for some of these countries, especially Mongolia, owes you know, 76% debt-to-GDP. Mongolia is owned by China. It's a democracy, but it is literally owned by China. You see this also in um, Pakistan that owns a quarter of its debt-to-GDP. Although Canada hasn't signed up, it's still supporting Beijing's initiative. Canada is included because it supports mechanisms that support the Belt and Road Initiative. They haven't signed on to any loans that are specifically Belt and Road, but they are involved in the supporting mechanisms. So we see them as an emerging CCP threat. The West has recently banded together to give less wealthy countries an option to borrow, instead of using China. It's called the Build Back Better World. It is important that these countries be um, uh, supported in their desire to grow um, stronger. And, and it is important that um, the free countries of the world that remain uh, provide an alternative to what China is offering through the Belt and Road Initiative. From a human rights perspective, the Captive Nations Coalition is raising awareness of human rights abuses in China, including genocide. It sees the forcible capture of China's bordering countries, Tibet, East Turkestan and Southern Mongolia, as enslaving those countries. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Still to come this evening. Credit cards from credit unions are often overlooked. But they may well be a good option for some. We ask an expert what advantages they offer. And can you always tell if your cat is happy or unhappy? If not, there is a new app to the rescue. Find out how it can help after this short break. I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled my pillow. And to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. Go to MyPillow.com right now to get deep discounts on all my pillow products. For example, you can get my premium my pillows regularly $69.98, now just $29.98, the lowest price ever. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today.
Welcome back. When you're bombarded with ads for credit cards at big banks, it's easy to overlook credit cards at a local credit union. And the news Andrew Thomas has more on why you might want to check them out. Credit unions are nonprofit organizations that usually require membership based on a connection to an employer, family member, or other organization. Credit unions issue credit cards, but they're often overlooked in favor of big bank issued cards. I think they're overlooked for a few reasons. You know, one is that these are not household names. You know, they don't have their name on the stadium. They don't have branches on every corner. They're not as well known. Sometimes they have special membership requirements. Although rewards and perks are often flashier on bank issued credit cards, credit union cards may offer generous incentives of their own, including lower fees, reduced interest rates, and flexibility. Alliant Credit Union has this Visa Signature card that's very popular. It gives 2.5% cash back on everything. They recently eliminated the annual fee, which makes that one more attractive. And that's actually one that's pretty easy to get into. Rossman recommends paying your credit card bill in full if you can. But if you can't, there are some credit union cards with favorable interest rates. For example, Navy Federal Credit Union has a card that the rate could be as low as 5.99%. You need really good credit to qualify for that. It could be up to 18% if you have lesser credit. But if you do want just a flat rate, low rate card, 5.99% is about as low as you're gonna see. When considering a credit union card, you should check if you're eligible first. Then research which options are most convenient and compare rewards, fees, and other benefits. Rossman recommends looking into the credit union card option, as maximizing rewards on everyday spending can really add up. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And some United Airlines passengers can now order food and snacks days before they board their flights. United has opened its new pre-order option to customers flying on select routes. The airline says they can order food, snacks and beverages up to five days before a flight using its website or mobile app. Customers who pre-order will have to use United's contactless payment system, which stores their credit card information on a digital wallet. Passengers who don't participate will still be able to order food and drinks during the flight. Venice will be banning giant cruise liners from the Venice Lagoon starting next month. There's been a clash between activists who say they're concerned about safety and the environment and port authorities and tourist operators who say the city needs business from the cruise industry. Francesca Liner reports. Giant cruise ships will be banned from Venice's lagoon as of August 1st. The government's decision to defend the city's ecosystem and heritage ends years of political hesitation. Finally satisfying activists like Tommaso Cacciari a member of campaign group No Grandi Navi. I'm very proud. For us, it's a big victory, not a small victory. Everyone knew we were disproportionately smaller than big cruise companies. It was so obvious that many compared us to David against Goliath. Us ordinary citizens with our little boats, simple and self-organized, against these giant ships that are not only giant in terms of size, but also in power and money. The ban will prohibit ships weighing more than 25,000 tonnes from passing through the shallow Giudecca Canal, past Piazza San Marco, the city's most famous landmark. That's where an MSC cruise ship collided with a dock and tourist boat as it approached the passenger terminal in 2019, injuring four people. Campaigners see the ban as a win for safety and the environment, but the battle may not be over. For workers in the cruise ship and tourism industry, the government's ban came as a blow. Antonio Veleca has worked for a baggage handling cooperative for over 15 years. It was a huge blow. I felt awful. I felt I had lost a lot of certainty in my life. We'd only just resumed work on June 5th after 19 months of inactivity. And 19 months without work for any person who's used to working? 
I've worked here for 15 years. It's unimaginable. Taking such a big decision without taking things gradually, without planning, is absurd. In our opinion, it's evil and a crime against the workers. Rome has passed legislation numerous times in the past to limit liners' access to Venice. But an alternative docking point is not yet ready. The government wants to fast-track a docking station at the industrial port of nearby Marghera. But there are no signs that this will be completed soon. And the new app, powered by artificial intelligence, claims it can decode the subtle facial cues of cats. It aims to deliver a speedy assessment of their well-being. Rosanna Philpott reports. Is your feline friend looking a bit grumpy? Notoriously inscrutable, cats aren't the best at letting their owners know when something is wrong. But a new app powered by artificial intelligence claims it can decode their subtle facial cues to deliver a speedy assessment of their well-being. It helps uh, human cat owners know if their cat is in pain or not. So it uses facial recognition technology. All you need to do is take a picture with your camera and then it can give you a result. The app, called Tabli, uses the feline grimace scale, or FGS, pain assessment for cats based on ear positioning, ear narrowing, muzzle tension, whisker change and head positioning. Mish Priest is venture lead at the developers, Sylvester.ai. It's a way for um, animal practitioners to be able to determine the level of pain that a cat is in. Uh, based on those facial characteristics. So if you're, if you're somebody who has a cat but you don't have that training, you can just use the app and, and, and it can help you determine this, how your cat is doing. At Wild Rose Cat Clinic in Calgary, where the developers trained the app's algorithm, Dr Liz Ruel hopes it will aid novice cat owners and graduate vets. I mean, what an amazing concept when it was first discussed. I know I was so excited because I love to say I'm good at what I do. I love working with cats. I've always grown up with cats. I really am a crazy cat person first. So I am quite adept at reading their body language. But for other colleagues, new grads, who maybe have not had quite so much cat experience, it can be very daunting to know, is your patient painful? Are we doing a good job at what we do? However, the app is not quite perfect, say some early adopters. Technology journalist Stephen Boysenolt tested the beta version and hit a few snags. So yeah, I used it when I was living with three cats and one of the cats was black and it, uh, the machine kind of, uh, the app kind of felt it a little bit difficult to, to read the, the cat's face just because black cats have darker faces. Um, there's less light for the, the complete image. Um, but it is it is machine learning, so it will learn as more people use use it. That's the whole kind of point of AI and machine learning within an app. That's the latest business updates for this week. Can still catch Anthony Evening News with Stephanie Cox. That's at 6.30 p.m. Eastern, final news of the week. For Anthony Business, that's all for this week. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.